Shalom Men's Orthodox Presbyterian Church in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Just a reminder, I'm feeling a little under the weather tonight, so I won't be shaking hands, but I will still be there at the back to greet you at the end of the service. Let's prepare our hearts and minds for the worship of the living God with a time of silent prayer. stand for our call to worship from Isaiah 9. Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, but in the future he will honor Galilee of the Gentiles by the way of the sea along the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be present in our midst this evening. Please turn with me to hymn number 205, Away in a Manger, number 205. this section makes. One is that assurance, even infallible assurance, is not of the very essence of faith. In other words, if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, it doesn't mean that you infallibly know it at every point in your life and never have any doubts. Nevertheless, you can achieve an assurance by God's grace without any kind of direct revelation from God. It's through the promises of the Scripture and through the Holy Spirit's work in your life, His testimony, and the fruit that He produces in your life. And that's, that fruit is the point of assurance. Assurance does not mean um, any kind of carnal security where, oh, I'm saved so therefore I can do whatever I want to. That's the opposite of what assurance does. In fact, those who think that way should not have assurance at all. 
So this is section 3 of chapter 18. Let us confess our faith together with these words. This infallible assurance doth not so belong to the essence of faith, but that a true believer may wait long and conflict with many difficulties before he be partaker of it. Yet being enabled by the Spirit to know the things which are freely given him of God, he may, without extraordinary revelation, in the right use of ordinary means, attain thereunto. And therefore it is the duty of everyone to give all diligence to make his calling and election sure, that thereby his heart may be enlarged in peace and joy in the Holy Ghost, in love and thankfulness to God, and in strength and cheerfulness in the duties of obedience, the proper fruits of this assurance, so far is it from inclining men to looseness. Chapter 1, Paul's an old man when he writes 2 Timothy, and he's trying to encourage Timothy because he knows that his time is short. What are his last words of encouragement to Timothy? And so he mentions the faith of Timothy and how thankful he is for that faith. That faith was a sort of covenantal faith. It started with his grandmother, Lois, and his mother, Eunice. And then this faith is given more definition throughout the chapter. It's a faith that does not need to make anyone ashamed, a faith for which Paul is in chains, and he's not ashamed of that. It's also a faith that has a kind of pattern to it. It says in verse 13 that there is a pattern of sound teaching. That is one of the passages that tells us that we need to connect the Bible together, passage to passage. We need to find out what the scripture as a whole says about individual topics. In short, it's the legitimation of systematic teaching, systematic theology. And it needs to be guarded, that same faith. So this, this first chapter is really all about the faith that Timothy believes and for which Paul is in chains. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is the word of our God. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, according to the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dear son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve, as my forefathers did, with a clear conscience, as night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers. Recalling your tears, I long to see you, so that I may be filled with joy. I have been reminded of your sincere faith which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. So do not be ashamed to testify about our Lord or ashamed of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. 
This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. But it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And of this gospel I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. That is why I am suffering as I am. Yet I am not ashamed, because I know whom I have believed, and am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him for that day. What you heard from me, keep as the pattern of sound teaching, with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. You know that everyone in the province of Asia has deserted me, including Fugalus and Hermogenes. May the Lord show mercy to the household of Onesephorus, because he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. On the contrary, when he was in Rome, he searched hard for me until he found me. May the Lord grant that he will find mercy from the Lord on that day. You know very well in how many ways he helped me in Ephesus. Let us come before the Lord our God in prayer. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, you have given faith to human beings, to those you have called according to your pleasure. You have given us that belief. You have put that belief in us. For we know we cannot take credit for it ourselves. It is not because of anything we have done, but because of your own purpose and grace. A grace that began before the foundations of the earth and was shown in Jesus Christ in history, who lived a flawless, perfect life to become the lamb that was spotless, to become our Passover lamb, to become the reason why wrath passes over us. And Father, we're thankful because we acknowledge our sin before you. We acknowledge that we have not done what you've commanded. We have done what you have forbidden. Our thoughts are messed up, Father. Our words are twisted. Our hearts are deceptive. And we fool ourselves, Father, into thinking that we're good of ourselves, that we have light in ourselves, that we have worthiness in ourselves. Father, you have revealed in your word that all goodness in us is a gift from you. All worthiness in us is because the Holy Spirit has put it there. And we have worth because of Jesus Christ. We have worth because we are made in your image. We have worth because you have placed it on us. But Father, we twist that in this world. And we take all of your good gifts and we twist them for our own purposes, for our own kingdom, for our own idolatries. And we plead for forgiveness, Father, on the basis of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. We thankful, Father, that you have promised in your word the forgiveness of our sins. When we confess them, when we repent of them, turn away from them and towards you, the living God. For you are gracious and merciful, and there is no end to your forgiveness for those who repent and turn in faith to Jesus Christ. We're thankful, Father, that you do not forgive us only once, but that you forgive us many, many times. We're thankful, Father, that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, that we have nothing to fear from the final judgment, that that judgment has been brought forward in history and laid on Jesus Christ so that we have no fear. And so we pray, Father, for the end of the sinful eon of this world. We pray, Father, 
as the new kingdom of Jesus Christ has been inaugurated, that it will be consummated so that the end of Satan's kingdom will be near. The fulfillment of your kingdom, near. And we pray, Father, for the conversion of the lost. We pray for their salvation. We pray that you will bless the message of your church, that it may be that of compassion, knowing that we all need grace. We all need forgiveness. We all need Jesus. And we pray, Father, that you will supply our daily needs, whether they be health-related, whether they be related to physical needs of food and sustenance, whether they be emotional needs, Father, spiritual needs, whatever lies heavy on our hearts, Father, we ask that you will carry that burden that you will yoke yourself to us to prove that your yoke is easy and your burden is light. We're thankful for your many precious promises that you will carry us, that you will help us, and that you will not abandon us in our time of trial. That we pray, Father, for the church as it continues to be persecuted worldwide, and we ask, Father, for the confession of the church to be clear and to be confident in the face of all opposition. We pray all of these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please turn with me to hymn number 211, God Rescue Mary, gentlemen. I know I mentioned this last year, but it's helpful to remember it because I had to look it up again. But the first line of this hymn does not mean God give rest to merry gentlemen. It means God give rest and peace, comma, gentlemen being a form of address. So God give you peace, gentlemen, and ladies are not excluded. So let's stand and sing number 211. Thank you. 
So verse 13 starts by showing us a very close connection between the heaven, uh, to the heavenly warfare that we looked at last week in verses 7 to 12. So what does that heavenly warfare look like? Remember, Michael and his angels fight against Satan and overcome Satan because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the testimony of the saints that is based on that spilled blood. And we said last time that the events in verses 7 to 12 are the events of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection and ascension into heaven. The very last sentence in verse 12 informs us that Satan knows his time is short. He knows he's a defeated enemy, that he doesn't have very much time left to him. So instead of just lying down and surrendering, he decides to make the very most of his time by assaulting the church as furiously as he can. And what that tells us is very simple. The reason why Satan is attacking the church so furiously is that Satan was thrown out of heaven and can no longer accuse the church in heaven. He's not a member of the court anymore. He's not the prosecuting attorney anymore. He's lost his position. So we can very easily think of these attacks of Satan as his form of revenge, can't we? You see, it's Jesus' blood who defeats Satan in the heavenly warfare. So Satan knows he cannot possibly defeat Jesus Christ now, that Jesus is at the right hand of the Father, completely immune from all future death. He's lost his chance. He tried very hard to defeat Jesus on earth, didn't he? Just look at the temptation scenes in Matthew, Mark, Luke. Satan also tries to get riots happening so that Jesus would be killed before the appointed time. That didn't work either. And now he doesn't even have access to Jesus. Can't get anywhere near him. Jesus is in heaven. Satan's thrown out of heaven. The only thing left he can attack is the bride of Christ left on earth. So in attacking the Bride of Christ, and we know, of course, that the Bride of Christ and Christ himself are indissolubly joined in the greatest matrimony of all. So in attacking the Bride of Christ, Satan knows that he can attack Christ that way. Indirectly, though, instead of directly. Now, in doing this, he's not, this is not a new strategy for Satan, per se. If you look back at the first Adam and the first Eve, he attacked the person he thought was more vulnerable. And Satan was attempting to subvert the structure of authority in Adam and Eve's case. He did not attack the head of the house. And as Satan did with the first Adam, so also he does with the last Adam. He tried attacking the last Adam, but that didn't work. So now he can only attack the last Eve as it were, the mother of those living in Christ, the church. We should remember then how important it is that the church is the bride of Christ. The church is as closely connected as any human being or group of human beings could possibly be to someone who is God. Christ is the head, the church is the body. So what John is doing here is describing for us the reason why Satan attacks the church. And the reason Satan attacks the church is because we're, the church is connected to Jesus. That's why false churches are never attacked by Satan. Why would he attack false churches? They're on his side. Why did Satan never attack the churches in Germany that supported Hitler's regime of terror? He didn't have to. It's why Satan never attacks churches that proclaim a false gospel today. He lets them alone. Even gives them prosperity and lots of resources. God might take the lampstand away from false churches, but Satan never will. To make this point in a more individual way for us, though, and Satan hates nothing more than the image of Christ 
being formed in a person. The more we look like Christ, the more Satan hates us. Because every time Satan looks at us and we look like Christ, he sees his victorious enemy sitting at the right hand of the Father in heaven. But it shouldn't really bother us, should it? That Satan hates us so much? I mean, we don't really want to please him, do we? Do we really want to trade an eternity of bliss in heaven with God the Father for a few cheap trinkets of experience on earth that fly away the moment we try to hang on to them? Jesus' side is the winning side. What we've been saying all along is the point of revelation. Jesus is going to win. The end is already determined. And Revelation tells us how it's going to end. And so this victory, this is, this is why Satan hates the church so much. It's why he's attacking the church at all times in history. Now in verses 14 to 16, we can see the way that God protects the church from these vicious attacks of Satan. The woman, who is the church, is given the wings of an eagle so she can fly away from her attacker and go into the wilderness. Now that language, wings and wilderness, that comes straight out of the book of Exodus. In Exodus 19, the Lord tells the Israelites that he bore them out of Egypt on eagles' wings. So the imagery of eagles' wings means protection from harm because the eagle can fly very high, high enough to be out of harm's way. And then, of course, this idea of the wilderness or the desert has rich exodus overtones, doesn't it? The wilderness is the in-between place. The in-between place, out of Egypt, but not in the promised land yet. They're being tempted, tried, just as Jesus was tempted in the wilderness for 40 days. One day for every year, the Israelites were in the wilderness. The wilderness is also a place of God's provision. There's water from the rock. There's food in the form of manna and quail. The Israelites learn to trust God in the wilderness because it's not their final home. They're weaned there from their memories of Egypt. They're constantly wanting to go back to Egypt, but in the wilderness they get weaned off of that. And this is exactly where the church is today, isn't it? The church is in the wilderness. We've been redeemed from our Egypt of sin, but we're not in the promised land of the new heavens and new earth. And so we're in the wilderness situation, just like Israel was. And God provides for us, not just food and water, but spiritual sustenance as well in the Word and the sacraments, and also protection from Satan's attacks. Notice the contrast between the kind of water that comes from the rock, who is Christ, versus the water that comes out of the mouth of Satan. Very, very different those waters have. The water from the rock that's Christ nourishes the people and keeps them from dying of thirst. But when Satan provides water, it's destructive. He wants it to be a flood that sweeps everything away. Notice that this water comes from the mouth of Satan. When we see that description, that water comes from the mouth, and then he's called the serpent in verse 14, then it's reasonable to conclude then that the water coming from the mouth of Satan is a flood of deception. What comes from the mouth? Words. So the way that Satan tries to kill the church is by a flood of deceptive words. Again, just like what he did in the garden. The protection is Jesus, the one who feeds his people, and the one who gives them nutritious water. Water that is 
still water, if we want to go to Psalm 23. Not the water that comes down those dangerous wadis that can destroy sheep so easily. But as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, the rock that followed the people was Christ. The rock out of which water came was Christ. And that's why John says in the account of the crucifixion that when the soldier pierced the body of Christ, out came blood and what? Water. In other words, Jesus provides not just for our guilt and our punishment by taking it on himself. He also provides our daily needs, our daily wilderness needs. He is the one who protects his church. He provides for her in the wilderness by washing her with water and the word. Now, very few people have ventured any kind of guess as to what John means by saying, that the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up that flood of deception. It's not clear how the earth could swallow up deceptive words. But the words themselves do come from the wilderness experience of the Israelites. In Exodus 15, verse 12, the earth swallows up the Egyptians who pursued the Israelites. It's also possible that the rebellion of Korah is in the background here as well. You might remember the story. Korah and his family rebel against Moses. They have a torrent of deceptive words. Moses isn't the true leader. We don't need to follow this Moses guy. He's not the one appointed by God. The ground opens up and swallows the deceivers. So while we don't know how the Lord uses the earth to swallow up the deceptive lies that Satan uses today, we do can, we can see from the incident of Korah's rebellion that the Lord can use any means at his disposal to prevent the church being swept away in a flood of deception. And we do know that John is echoing the language of the wilderness experience of the Israelites. And, and so that becomes a description of how God protects his church. And so we get to verse 17, which is a summary of the previous verses. The dragon was enraged at the woman, went off to make war against the rest of her offspring, those who obey God's commandments and hold to the testimony of Jesus. So what does all this look like for us in our Christian walk? Well, the first thing to remember and reflect on is that wilderness idea. It's such a rich metaphor in the Bible. It helps us remember our origins where we came from, as well as where we're going. And it reminds us of the fact that we're not there yet. That's the important point of wilderness. Where did you come from? An Egypt of sin and death. Where are you going? The promised land, new heavens and new earth. But you're not there yet. You're in the wilderness. The wilderness is not your home. It's only on the way home. And so it prevents us from getting so comfortable with the wilderness that we start calling the wilderness our final resting place and home. We can have a home in Illinois as long as we remember it's not our final home. And that, has, that reminder has two benefits for the Christian life because first, it helps us when things get so bad around us that we can be tempted to despair. It's not our home. It's only temporary. If this were a permanent state of affairs, there would be reason, perhaps, to sink into depression. But this is not permanent. In fact, our text repeats the idiom for a short time by saying we're in the wilderness for a time, times and half a time. Literally, that's three and a half years. Metaphorically, that means a short time. All times are short compared with eternity. So what is God doing then in the wilderness with us? He's weaning us from our love of the world, just like he weaned the Israelites from their love of Egypt. He's redirecting our focus to where we're headed. 
so that we can live in the wilderness from the perspective of someone who is as if they already are in the new heavens and new earth. In other words, we try to use our imaginations to say, my citizenship is in heaven. That's where I belong. I'm stuck in this in-between place right now. But I know where I belong. I know where my home is. The other benefit this idea of the wilderness has for the Christian life is that when things go well, we have a defense against the temptation to think of this world as our home. Because the, the lure of the world is always going to be there. The lure of comfort, the lure of all of the idols and toys of the world. Now, of course, the whole world already belongs to God. And anything that we have in this life, we should hold with an open hand and not a closed fist. But it helps us, even when things are well. The, the wilderness is not the final place. C.S. Lewis talked about this once. Very memorable words. He says, you know, the people who are satisfied with this world, they don't have their sights set too, too high. They're set too low. They're like children who are satisfied with playing in a mud puddle because they have no idea what a day at the beach is like. We are far too easily pleased. This world has nothing to offer compared to the next one. Nothing. In fact, what it offers is the reverse of the next world. It only offers, ultimately, condemnation. The wilderness situation is the first main application for us. The second main application is that we need to always be on the lookout for those deceptive floods of words that come from Satan. He doesn't issue out a little trickle here and a little trickle there and hope to deceive people. He wants to sweep people away. He sends it forth in a flood. There is false teaching on every side. And I have seen this one incontrovertible fact. Christians, and even sometimes long-standing ones, are often gullible. It's true. We're sheep, and that is not a compliment in the scriptures. We're gullible. If the person even sometimes claims to be a Christian, we'll often think that what that person says is gospel truth. Especially if it has any connection to our own personal experience. But as a matter of fact, I would say the vast majority of Christian books written in the last 50 years are either heresy or still deeply flawed. In other words, our fundamental stance towards recent teaching should be actually a bit on the suspicious side instead of being automatically accepting. We always need to bring things back to the touchstone of Scripture. And by that I don't mean it can kind of sort of sound like the Bible. I mean it has to accord with what we know the Bible says. The Christian faith is once for all delivered to the saints. It has a pattern of sound teaching, as we saw in our reading from 2 Timothy. But that means, then, that oftentimes the older books are more sound. There's excellent new books out there, don't get me wrong. But the best Christian books that have been written recently are profoundly non-original. Profoundly dependent on the wisdom of the past. Charles Hodge, a professor of systematic theology at Princeton Seminary in the 19th century, he once boasted of Princeton Seminary that they taught absolutely nothing new. 
Nothing new is taught at Princeton. Does that mean that we despise everything new? Of course not. God can still bring new light to bear on the scriptures. But here's the key thing. If we hear about some brand new insight into what the Bible means, we must immediately ask the question of whether that helps us to understand the old faith in a deeper way, or whether it changes the old faith into something else. And that is the key question. Or to put it another way, the only valid new insights dig deeper to understand the same truths better. They don't invent new truths and thus shift sideways into something else. Thirdly, we need to hold on to the commandments of God and to his testimony in the word. Verse 17 tells us that the people who do that, who hold fast, look at the end of verse 17, who does Satan make war against? those who obey God's commandments and hold to the testimony of Jesus. <clears throat> That's public enemy number one for Satan. The person who obeys command, God's commandments and who holds to the testimony of Jesus is Satan's public enemy number one. What does that mean? He makes wars with those who keep the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus. Hold to the commandments of God. This doesn't mean exclude the gospel. The testimony is of Jesus. The testimony of Jesus is about the gospel. So he's talking about law and gospel here. To understand them in their proper relationship. To understand how the law tells us of the perfect, perfect obedience of Christ. How it tells us that we are insufficient and that Christ is sufficient. And how it's also a guide for the Christian life. And also that Jesus obeyed that law perfectly in our place. And that, that he's therefore our ticket to heaven. So what do we do in this grand scheme, this great war that goes on between the dragon and the woman? We hold to the commandments. We hold to the testimony. Yes, that means manufacturing ourselves into targets for Satan to attack. But we've got God protecting us. Far greater power on our side. This is our story, and that, as the saying goes, is the rest of the story. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that your power is greater than that of our enemy. That the end of the story is victory in Jesus Christ. That Satan is already in principle a defeated enemy. But help us, Father, as we live in the wilderness now. Help us when things are bad and when things are good to remember that this world is not our final destination. Help us to cling to the truth of the law and the gospel that you have revealed in your word so that we will not be swept away by Satan's floods of deception. We pray for your church to stand fast by your grace. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please turn with me to hymn number 213, What Child Is This? We'll stand and sing 213.
blessing and benediction. To him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, power, and authority. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore.